All right. All right, so I'd like to um, welcome everybody to the Sustainable Water Networks River Series. I'm Kristen Wolf, the coordinator for the Sustainable Water Network. And I apologize for my voice and coughing because I'm getting over a sinus infection. But I just wanted to say um, a little bit about um, this network, this coalition. Um, we have been focusing on river issues, um, specifically river flows and getting water laws changed to better protect our rivers. And we've tried doing this by getting water laws changed to include a watershed health bill, which would have allowed more water for our rivers. It would have recognized and started to address the issue of groundwater pumping and river flow depletion. And it would have required um, various uh, river and watershed surveys so we could get more data about our rivers, such as eflows and, and other data that's just been missing about our rivers and watersheds. So we tried for over four years to try and get this done, and it was difficult to either get a hearing or get it moved out of the committee if it did get a hearing. Um, but we're going to keep trying, and we're going to keep doing more um, public um, education, um, such as this river series. And the purpose of this river series is to generate more interest, more love, more care for our remaining uh, rivers. And we're doing that by asking local experts who live in the communities near rivers, who work with rivers, um, and asking them to share their stories about what these rivers mean to them and what it means to keep these rivers flowing you know, for people, for plants, for animals, for, for whole ecosystems. Um, so, so nobody denies the importance of the Colorado River and all the attention it's getting, um, but we have other rivers that are facing issues with climate change and or groundwater pumping. All of our rivers are facing depletion challenges and um, all of these rivers need some more attention as well. Um, so tonight, we are grateful to have Luke Cole and Claire Zugmeyer uh, from the Sonoran Institute to discuss a living river, the Santa Cruz River from Mexico to, to Marana. The recent history and ecology of the Santa Cruz River, including management initiatives and future strategies to secure and increase water to this important living river. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to um, our steering committee member um, and San Pedro warrior, um, Tricia Gerardet, to introduce um, Luke and Claire. Thank you, Tricia. Sure. Hi, everybody. Luke Cole is the Associate Director for Resilient Communities and Watersheds. Luke became that associate director upon joining the Sonoran Institute in 2018. He manages the ongoing projects on the Santa Cruz River, working with staff and collaborators to restore and enhance this living river in the heart of the Southern Arizona and Northern Sonora. Prior to joining the Sonoran Institute, Luke worked for the Washington DC city government, tracking the district's green infrastructure and water quality improvement programs with a focus on coordinating tree planting programs and policy. Luke has a PhD in environmental sciences from the University of Virginia, an MS in oceanography from the University of Rhode Island and a BA in biology from St. Mary's College of Maryland. Clara Zuckmeyer is the lead ecologist and project manager for the Santa Cruz River projects. Joining Sonoran Institute in 2007, she leads a variety of efforts, including production of the Living River series that summarizes river conditions monitoring fish and other parameters along the river, 
and organization of the annual Santa Cruz River Research Days, an event promoting collaboration and awareness of regional research and conservation efforts. She completed a Master of Science in Wildlife and Fisheries Biology at the University of Arizona, a Bachelor of Science in Ecology, Behavior, and Evolution at the University of California, Los Angeles, and has worked on a variety of research and management projects, focusing on birds, mammals, fish, and amphibians, including Arizona's endangered Mount Graham red squirrel, which is getting more endangered. <laughs> so, turning it over to Claire and Luke, take it away. Thank you, Tricia and Kristen. Um, thank you so much for having us here this evening and for all of you guys for joining us. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Hopefully you guys can see it. It says that you can see it. I assume that's the case. Um, I can't see you anymore, but that's okay. I'm going to move forward. So thank you so much for, for joining. Good, Claire, we can see it. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for joining um, this evening. I'm really happy to share some um, recent news, uh, recent information about the Santa Cruz and some of our work on this on that Sonoran Institute has been doing um, for the last decade or so um, with many of our partners. And if you are not familiar with Sonoran Institute, we are a conservation nonprofit. We work throughout the West um, with a simple mission to connect people to the natural resources that sustain us. And so we work currently on a lot of different water issues and river issues, including the Santa Cruz River. And we're founded in Tucson. So we've been working in some capacity on the Santa Cruz River and in the watershed um, since 1990. And uh, we are working towards a vision of the river from Mexico to Marana as a living and flowing river and the foundation of community health and prosperity. So I probably don't need to tell anyone in this group how important water is, um, particularly in the Southwest, but I often open my presentations noting that the rivers and their riparian areas and these wetlands, they only represent 2% of the landscape in the Southwest. And yet 80% of wildlife use these areas at some point during their life cycle. So very important for, for a lot of wildlife, even though they're rare. And this is really obvious for things like the endangered Gila top minnow here in the upper uh, right, but maybe less obvious for things like the dragonflies. And they actually spend the majority of their life in the water as larvae and only emerge uh, as adults like what the one we see here and they're really important food for a lot of different animals both in the river and then for birds and other things once they come out as adults so these rivers and sources of water are clearly very important for people too and the santa cruz has an incredibly rich history and um, it dates back to over 12,000 years of people living in this area. And it's been possible because of the Santa Cruz River and the watershed that, that has supported the river and been supported by the river. You can read a lot about the history of the river in an online publication that we put out, um, oh gosh, several years ago, a, a while ago now, but the information is still valid. Um, so I encourage you to, to look for that on our website, but um, we have a, lo a, a long history with the river. And one thing that I always find really interesting is even though we, it's very arid here, we have the longest continuous record of agriculture in North America right here along the Santa Cruz River. And that dates back to about 4,000 years. And that is because of the Santa Cruz River. So um, people living here and the agriculture and the, 
Spanish missionaries and then all the people that have come since um, are thanks to the river and the water it provided. And I wanted to just share two photos that are in this publication of what the river one at one point in time looked like. I mean, the river has gone through lots of different phases and each stretch of the river has looked different at different points in time. But this is the view of the river from a mountain on the left, um, looking north towards what will become you know, downtown Tucson, and then more towards the south, um, looking towards Martinez Hill. And you see a lot of things in these two photos that we don't see so much anymore. So a lot of agriculture, um, a, you know, water in the river and riparian trees and um, not so like a, a wide floodplain. And a lot of these things have changed since these photos were taken. Um, and there's a variety of, of reasons for why um, things have changed. We've developed along the corridor. We've pumped a lot of groundwater. We have um, changed the natural flows of our waterways, but um, our river is still there and it's still alive just in a different way than it was at the point that these photos were taken. Um, so I wanted to take a moment to orient you toward, to the Santa Cruz River watershed. So those two photos were, were from this area here in Tucson, but that's already a good ways down in the, in the watershed. So um, the river actually starts in the San Rafael Valley um, down here in, in close to the US-Mexico border and it flows south into Mexico and makes a U-turn and then flows north past Nogales and past Tucson and eventually in, um, joins the Gila River and then the Gila River um, joins the Colorado River. So like many of our Arizona rivers were part of the Colorado uh, River watershed. And um, it's the only river that crosses the US-Mexico border twice. And historically, the river didn't necessarily flow as one continuous ribbon of water from start to finish. In fact, after Marana, it was very often dry. I think it was nicknamed the 90 mile desert perhaps. Um, I'm forgetting the exact <laughs> number of miles, but uh, it's definitely a stretch that was dry most of the time. But there were many, many places along the river where there was water available year round. And all along the river, you can find evidence of, of various points in time when people have been living along the river. And what many people are often surprised by is because we so often focus on the stretches that are now dry from overpumping and, and many other factors. We actually still have um, stretches that are flowing year round. And right now we have three that are shown here. These blue uh, reaches are the stretches that are flowing year round thanks to the release of uh, wastewater or treated highly treated effluent or recycled water um, from our urban areas. So we have um, this one in the south that um, is actually water coming from Nogales, Sonora and Nogales, Arizona. And that's treated in the US at the Nogales International Wastewater Treatment Plant. And then it flows north um, for a variable number of miles, about 20 miles. Um, and then we have in the Tucson Marana area, two major regional facilities, um, Pima County facilities that, that release water and have been releasing water into the river since the seventies, um, creating, I'm not sure if it still holds this, this um, title, but at least when we started um, studying this stretch of the river. It was the longest effluent dependent stretch of river in Arizona. Um, not sure if that's still the case. And then our newest stretch of river that's flowing around thanks to um, recycled water is in the downtown reach. And that's our Santa Cruz River Heritage 
um, reach that Tucson Water started. So just to give you a flavor of what these three reaches look like, though, even within these reaches, there's a lot of variable conditions. So these are just some, some single views of the river. Um, you have up here, the river near to Makakari um, with its um, cottonwood gallery forests. And down here, we have the river in the north West Tucson and Marana area um, near Cortero Road. Um, lots of native willows, not quite so many cottonwoods in this reach, but um, there are lots of native willows. And then in the downtown reach that started flowing in 2019, our newest stretch, um, we won't have trees, but we have lots of other uh, riparian vegetation. And um, this is a photo from I think in January 2021 when there was a buffalo grass and trash cleanup happening. So this source of water, um, you know, it's not a natural source. Our river is not still flowing in these areas. There are a couple areas where the river is still naturally flowing. Down in Mexico, some parts of the headwaters, um, and also a small stretch um, in the San Javier district of Tohono O'odham Nation, but these big stretches with flowing river are sourced from our urban areas. So when we shower, when we flush toilets, do dishes, all this water makes its way to the facility, to the reclamation facilities, gets cleaned, and then um, in the Pima County area, some of this water gets uh, put into the reclaim system and everything else goes into the river. And we get so many benefits from this process, um, but it's not without its challenges. So we actually um, really started focusing on these effluent stretches starting in 2005, um, which is a little bit before I joined Sonoran Institute, but there was a die off of trees along an eight mile stretch of the river. And, in the Nogales area. And this is actually, for those of you who are familiar with this area, this is the bridge in Rio Rico. Um, so we're looking north and all of this gray are trees that just, I'm told that the community said they died overnight and everybody was really surprised by this and, and didn't know why the trees were suddenly dying because there's water in the river and it just didn't make any sense. So this event actually became the catalyst for Sonoran Institute and partners to develop the Living River Report Series, which is an annual effort to track and share the conditions of the river in these, in these flowing reaches um, so that we can understand what's happening and hopefully avoid being surprised by any kind of die off of trees and maybe even um, see things happening before they get to a point um, where such an event would happen. And so the first report was released in 2008. We worked with a, a group of, of biologists and hydrologists to pick indicators of river health um, that we would summarize on an annual basis. And the first one came out as our baseline report. And we just happened to do it the year before the Nogales International Treatment Plant was upgraded. So we had this perfect before, during upgrade and after upgrade with our, by the time we got to the third. And we have been continuing to monitor and report on conditions since. Um, and we've seen tremendous improvements along the stretch of the river. And we expanded to expanded this series to include the Tucson area in 2012 um, in partnership with Pima County and the Regional Flood Control, Flood Control District. <laughs> um, they said, hey, Sonoran is too, we are specifically planning to, we know we're upgrading our two major regional facilities and we wanna do what you guys just happened to catch um, with your original series. And we wanna document the changes and really showcase the, the benefits of this $600 million investment in the upgrades to the two facilities. 
And so um, here we were really trying to capture these upgrades and had a slightly different set of indicators that were chosen, but again, had this baseline in 2013. And then uh, uh, during the upgrade, it was partially before and after, and then a full year after. And then we've continued reporting on conditions annually since. And last year in September, we released the first report that also includes conditions in the Heritage Reach um, and Tucson Water joined uh, this partnership as well. So it's been really exciting. And I wanted to share with you some of the story of what we've been seeing, starting first with um, the bigger flowing stretches, the, the one near Nogales, um, which will always be on the left, and then in Marana, uh, Northwest Tucson and Marana Reach, um, that will, um, whose data will show on the right. So just to give you a feel for how much water is being released annually, the, these two, um, Stretches are not the same. We have, even though there's a lot of water in the Nogales Reach coming from Mexico and from Arizona, um, it's a lot smaller still when you compare it to the amount of water we're annually putting into the river in the Tucson area. Um, but even with these differences, we see a lot of similarities in, in the story of higher quality water being put into the river. So first of all, the, you know, it's wastewater and nitrogen and ammonia. It's a very common thing in our wastewater. And, you know, these things are not a problem. Plants love nitrogen. They, you know, a lot of things need these nutrients, but too much of it can be a problem. And in particular, ammonia at very high concentration is toxic to aquatic wildlife. And so this was a major reason why all three of these plants were upgraded because we've had seen improvements in technology to remove nutrients and we're you know, constantly learning how to improve the treatment of, of wastewater. So ammonia was a big thing that we expected to decrease after the upgrades. And so you see before the upgrade, we had very high concentrations of ammonia in both reaches. And after the upgrade, here I'm only showing you data from 2019, but um, there were very low to no detections of ammonia in some cases. And I just want to point out that as the river flows downstream, any ammonia in the, in the water naturally degrades um, with time as it travels. So it's not totally fair to compare these values like 0.5 to 1 um, because the sites where these were monitored were not at the same distance downstream of the treatment facilities so um, they're probably more similar than than this makes it makes it look but big story is huge improvements in the quality of water being put into the river and as a result, we've been seeing tremendous increase in aquatic invertebrate diversity. So, you know, these dragonflies, um, mayflies, all these things that start their lives in the river have been increasing. Before the upgrade, we saw very few um, species, even, you know, these were quick grab samples um, to do a quick assessment of what's there using a method that the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality uses in their stream assessments. And before the upgrade, we had very few um, and, and comparable numbers. And immediately following, we saw the number of invertebrate species increase. And as of 2020, we've gone up to 16 in the Nogales area and an average of 14 in the Tucson area. And if you look at the cumulative total of unique species, um, you know, we're up to 49 and 51, which is, is really good. And we're having um, more species that are pollution sensitive appearing, which were not even present at all before the upgrades. So very exciting um, news. And as you would expect, the fish diversity is also increasing. Before the upgrade, 
um, we had, we did find fish, but very, very few. Um, just to note that the pictures with the yellow boxes are native species and the ones without are non-native species. So before the upgrade in the Nogales area, we did have a native fish, this long fin dace, but we only found two individual fish. It was one of my very first surveys um, on the river and it was, we worked hard to find those two individual fish. Um, in Tucson, uh, we did find Western mosquito fish, more than, more than two fish, but we only found these at the most downstream sites, you know, far downstream from the outfalls. And following the upgrades, quickly saw an increase in diversity and in a given year, we've had as many as four species found in the Nogales area and six species in Tucson. And I would love to see only native fish, but it's very exciting that fish can now survive in the, in the water. And we are making progress in terms of having uh, more native fish. And the biggest, most big career moment that I've gotten to see twice now is the return of the endangered Gila top minnow. This small, yet I think very charismatic fish used to be everywhere in the Gila River Basin. And now it's really limited in its, in its distribution. And I think is often found in more isolated places, not in our main rivers, but it returned to the Santa Cruz twice. First in 2015 to the Nogales Reach and then in 2017 um, to the Tucson reach. We don't know exactly how it returned, but uh, it did. <laughs> um, we just know that no agency like Game and Fish or Fish and Wildlife Service um, purposely restocked them. So they pro presumably swam there um, from upstream or in the Tucson case, they might've come from Cienega Creek, which is a tributary in, in the Tucson area. So super exciting. This, to switch gears a little bit, this higher quality water has also benefited the river by having a better, uh, more natural function in that it, the river is recharging better. It's actually allowing water to filter through the sediments into the aquifer in a more natural way. Before the water quality was so poor that we had developed a clogging layer with all the microorganisms and the um, plant um, algal stuff. It's a mixture of things that become so numerous trying to break down those nutrients that are so abundant in the water that they clog all the pores in the, in the riverbed and prevent water from from trickling down. So that is a major reason why we saw the die off of trees near Nogales because there was water in the river, but the trees could not access the water. The clogging layer was so poor. And that was some research done by Amy McCoy when she was um, at Sonora Institute, but getting her PhD at the same time. And so as soon as the water quality was better, we started you know, poking holes in this clogging layer and eventually getting rid of it. So we see increased recharge, which is incredibly important for the aquifer, um, especially in the Tucson area where these stretches of the river are actually being managed for recharge. So it's good for the water owners to receive higher uh, recharge credit for the water. Um, the flip side of this increased recharge is that the river is getting shorter or has gotten shorter and is more variable, but it's much better for the river to be functioning in a more natural way. Um, and so we've seen similar, but you know, slightly different um, changes in flow extent. In the Nogales area, um, we've seen some pretty variable changes that have now stabilized and we seem to be in this comfortable um, somewhere between 14 and 17 miles of, of flow in June, which is our simple you know, snapshot in time of the hottest, driest month. Um, so we get a, an idea of minimum flow extent. 
And in Tucson, um, you know, we have two points of release into the river. And before the upgrade, we had the full 23 miles were flowing in June and actually went another five miles further into Pinal County. And after that, we started seeing a dry spot developing, which is in part because the new facility at Trace Rios, some of the water from Agua was transferred to Trace Rios, but a lot of it is due to this increased recharge um, in this area. And then we've seen you know, incredible decrease in flow extent at Trico, though it is you know, increasing um, and it's, it's variable. So that's one part of the story that we've been seeing. And in the downtown area, this is a much newer stretch. So we're new in this story of the heritage reach, but the flows began in 2019 on a very hot day. <laughs> and even though it was probably one of the hottest days, we had over 400 people out there so excited to see Tucson Water launch this new flow of water in the downtown reach, which is very meaningful because this is a part of the river that has tremendous history with, you know, historically ran, had water year round. And that's why, you know, Tucson is here because this is the birthplace of Tucson. So really exciting. And this is a different view from it um, in 2021. Um, again, we're looking north, the outfalls is in this a bunch of cattails. And at this point in time, some of the water was backing up, but it does flow north. And so you see a lot of vegetation uh, has come up. And that was actually a very quick and easy thing to change to see. You know, if you add water, the wetland vegetation will quickly establish. And it's, it was pretty impressive. And, and now there's this beautiful wetland habitat right where they're adding water. And Tucson Water and, and the county have been trying with all the management that's very complex in this narrower downtown reach, they have been working to preserve this area and that's been really helpful even if um, there's other management needs in the area, they have maintained this, this wetland area. The other thing that we've seen is that dragonflies quickly found the new flows. Um, if anybody has not heard Michael Bogan share his research, uh, I highly encourage um, getting to hear about the work that he's doing because it's really incredible. He was out at the, at the launch of the heritage flows and within hours saw dragonflies at the water. And, which is very impressive considering how small these dragonflies are, yet they managed to find the water. And so he started doing dragonfly surveys and quickly noticed that, you know, they, many dragonflies established and are, were comparable to a site in the Marana area where we've had water for decades. And they, they were following the same pattern of naturally declining in winter. And even after a big removal of sediment um, that had to be done in this area in May of 2020, they still bounced right back um, when the water came back on. Um, I think this was the only time where they were forced to turn off the water completely for a brief amount of time. Um, otherwise, they've been trying to maintain steady, fairly, or some water. Um, the amount of water coming out has varied. And then um, in October, 2020, another really exciting moment for um, me, I got to help Game and Fish and US Fish and Wildlife Service to capture Gila Top Minnow from the Nogales part of the river and release them into the heritage reach. Um, we just didn't want to wait for the Top Minnow to get there on their own and um, also really helpful to have fish established so hopefully people would see that there's already fish in the river and, and discourage people from adding other things to the river which unfortunately 
was happening already prior to this. Um, there were some mosquito fish found that we tried to remove prior to the top minnow being released. But another big exciting moment for the Santa Cruz. And it doesn't stop. <laughs> we keep having good news for the river just last month. Um, we waited five years for long fin days to make their way. I kept hoping they would come down in some impressive flows when there were moments when these stretches of river were connected. But our annual fish survey has not detected long fin days yet in, in either the Heritage Reach or the Northwest to Marana Reach. And so Arizona Game and Fish, and Fish and Wildlife Service, Pima County, and University of Arizona um, brought the long fin days to both of these reaches. The primary site being um, a site near Camino del Cerro, which is near the Agua Nueva treatment facility, and then a hundred or so at the Heritage. And Luke was there and got to capture this on video. Um, hopefully it comes through. And this long fin dace are not endangered like the top minnow and they're pretty pretty tough and resilient native fish but it, the distance might have just been too far so really exciting to be able to help them get to the stretch of the river because both top minnow and dace historically had been in the santa cruz river in this in the tucson area but with the drying of the river and then poor water quality you know most of the native fish just disappeared and hadn't been in the area for uh, 70 or 70 more years. And I, oops, I think with that, I'm now gonna hand it over to Luke to share some other aspects of our work on the river. That's right, Claire, it's always a tough act to follow. Oh. Um, you are, it's true. Um, so yeah, I want to talk with you all. So Claire's done a really nice job of giving you the history of the Santa Cruz and bringing you up to speed on what a lot of major capital improvements have done um, around infrastructure that have improved conditions in the Santa Cruz. Uh, so now I want to talk to you a little bit more about where, we, where we're going, what's new, and how this all fits into Sonoran Institute's broader long-term vision um, for the for the American West and for Northern Sonora. So next slide, please, Claire. All right. So, you know, we've just talked about a lot. Seems like we're in a really good place, right? But you know, there's always improvement um, to be had. So, we are we Sonoran Institute, um, and with the help of our partners, are continuing to search to seek policy. Uh, and, and really legal mechanisms that will secure water for the river. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, and, and paired with that are where can we optimize flow where there's already water available, but it may not be being used for or in the river. Uh, at the same time, where the river is flowing is where there are some large population centers. And unfortunately, uh, we're a sloppy species and we let our trash run run real loose. So we're doing some work right now around trash in the Santa Cruz River up here in Pima County for starters. And again, as it's part of Sonoran Institute's mission, how do we connect people to the river? So next up, please, Claire. So, you know, a lot of what Claire's been talking about since these upgrades are we've got really clean water going into the Santa Cruz River, really clean water, especially compared to other effluent dominated uh, rivers in the state and really nationwide. So as we have, as our water portfolios collectively start to dwindle, uh, all the people are, are already starting to eye this water um, that could be otherwise used for groundwater recharge and when the when it finally becomes palatable potentially for um, reuse as drinking water. So we need to figure out what we want as a community. How can we secure this water for the river and make good management decisions so that you know our residents are able to still thrive that rely on this water, but so is the wildlife, so is the river corridor. Next slide, please. 
So in 2021, Pima County received approval to permanently allocate water to the Santa Cruz River. And this doesn't exist in any other stretches of the Santa Cruz River. Really at any point, it'd be hard to do, but at any point, the water that's creating that, that effluent that's creating the Santa Cruz River could be used for any other purpose as determined by those who control uh, you know, the flows of that water. So uh, what is so huge is that our partners at Pima County working with us on our annual fish surveys that we do in partnership with Arizona Game and Fish and Fish and Wildlife Service and others took a look at our Living River reports and what they saw and what they used was that in that dry stretch of the river that Claire was talking about earlier that just that's upstream yeah you got it right there upstream of the Tres Rios plant and downstream of Agua Nueva where in June some, you know, at the driest time of the year, we were seeing as much as a two mile stretch of that river that was drying out. And it's the endangered Gila top minnows habitat as, the, as we saw it in 2019 and 2020. So what happened is that Pima County applied for access to this intergovernmental program between Pima County and the city of Tucson called the Conservation Effluent Pool. And they used these data specifically to justify putting 5 million gallons a day into that dry stretch of the river, that sort of beige bar there, to prevent any future drying or to attempt to prevent any future drying. No promises. But in their doing that, they did that in perpetuity. So now we have a model for allocation of water into the Santa Cruz River uh, that can't be taken away. So in the future, this is again what I was talking about, how can we optimize the existing water that's in the river to make it more permanent, to make it more secure so we can, can, can continue to see the expansion uh, of this riparian habitat that we know is so important. Next slide, please, Claire. Um, so, like I mentioned before, trash is a major issue in the Santa Cruz. Here is a picture on the left. This is just north of Tumacocri National Historic Park. This is a 14, let's say 15 acre trash barge that is collected year over year over year and it's covered in poison hemlock. And it has now caused the Santa Cruz River to jump its bank, run in an older historical channel that hadn't been running through before reconnecting to the to its more traditional, more recent channel. It's a huge problem and it's unbelievably sad. And it's also very preventable and addressable. Uh, additionally, here on the right, uh, we see a lot of trash in the Santa Cruz River in the urban population core uh, of Tucson and in the parts of the river that flow north of the city where there's still frequent access by residents and tourists alike. So it's a threat to the riparian ecosystem and it just, it's, it looks bad. You can do all sorts of infrastructure improvements. You can bring people to the river and make beautiful bike paths and beautiful trails. But if you're looking down in the river and it's full of trash, it really, I would think lower your likelihood of coming back because it really hurts the spirit of what the place is. So we have been working with our, many of our partners to start bringing awareness to this, both through some research and then on the next slide, Claire, through trash cleanups, which we were just about to do a huge one uh, and then the pandemic hit. So uh, our very smart team in our media and marketing department at Sonora Institute came up with this Not In My River campaign. The idea being you would, if you can't get together for a big trash cleanup, Go out there to the river, go to in your neighborhood, the small washes, really anywhere, and pick up some trash, put it on social media, and challenge your friend, your neighbor, your coworker, whoever, another organization to get out there and clean up some trash with using this not in my river hashtag. Um, it's particularly important to do this in your neighborhood, certainly around Tucson, because we don't have a whole lot of stormwater infrastructure because it doesn't rain for a whole lot of the year. So instead, what we have are these uh, concave streets where when it rains, it picks up everything 
And especially during high velocity storms, it whooshes it down into the washes and then ultimately into the rivers, cause, causing, we think, a lot of the trash that we're seeing in the river. So you can really make a difference in your own home. Next slide, please. And as the, you know, as the pandemic progressed and we learned more, we started feeling more comfortable at doing outdoor trash cleanups, maintaining distance, of course. And this is an example of one of them that happened in October of 2021. A local artist came up with the Santa Crusaders uh, logo, and we got a whole bunch of people here together. You can look on the bottom of the poster. There are nonprofits. There are municipal entities. There are for-profit companies like REI. Paragon is a company that makes spacesuits for astronauts. We have a lot of org uh, community organization groups. We have the Trashy Divas. These are cool retiree ladies who go out there and they find a site and they just clean the heck out of it. Um, and other organizations like Caterpillar, you know, big, big corporations. Everybody's interested in this. And in just one day like this, we're able to pull two tons of trash out of the river with over 100 volunteers. It's a great thing. And it's really nice to see this happening more and more. Next up, please. And it's all good that people are doing this. But I'm a scientist. And Sonoran Institute uses science to back the work that we do. That's what makes our Living River Reports so special and so impactful. So in the spirit of that, uh, we now have an intern from the University of Arizona who is dedicated uh, to going out there and finding where the trash is. And then once she's there, does a very scientific assessment of what is there, what kind of trash is it. And we have about 100 different categories of trash that Jamie is recording when she goes out there. And this is a very, very simple process. It's extremely scientific, but it's just counting. Something that a person can do, you know, in 15 minutes once you get good at it. So at this point now, we have done over 125 different assessments of trash locations along the Santa Cruz River that we can use and share with our partners like our funders for this Pima County Regional Flood Control District, district to talk about hey, here's where we know the trash is. Here's what it's made up of. Here's how much it weighs. And then we can start having conversations about addressing that trash at its source, or at the very least, trying to contain it before it makes its way into the river. Next up. And all of this happens really in the spirit of, of community engagement, connecting people with the natural resources that sustain them. And one great way to do that is to get people out there to the river to appreciate some of the amenities, some of the ecological amenities that we have. And like we've been talking about, dragonflies are a big deal here. They're a really good indicator of good system health, and they're really beautiful. Uh, we're finding that there's a burgeoning, if not established, dragonfly and damselfly ecotourism industry. Just like people go out and do bird watches, uh, we have a lot of tourism along the Santa Cruz River for dragonflies. There are tons of species, they're so colorful and beautiful. So we decided, let's take advantage of that interest. And now we've done three dragonfly days. Yeah, uh, also in October. And the first year was, of course, in person. Uh, and then we had to switch over to a digital uh, and virtual effort. And this year we're able to do a virtual presentation, but then brought people out to the river for a tour. And this is a really great, you know, all ages event. And one of the outreach efforts and techniques that we've been using is we've worked with Pima County to create these dragonfly nature to go kits. So you can see this sweet picture here on the left uh, of this kid that has used our nature to go kit that has information about dragonflies and damselflies. It has a little craft kit for making a dragonfly and they include one of our living river reports. And these nature to go kits went to every single library in Pima County. So the, and they're, they're apparently a really popular thing with families. So this is another way for us to get the word out about the Santa Cruz River throughout the county and engage kids and adults alike. Next up, please. 
And we're really fortunate here in Pima County to have a very uh, resident benefit, ecological benefit minded um, county administration. Right now, uh, as part of the probably a decade old FEMA requirement, Pima County Flood Control has been looking at all of the river related infrastructure for a large stretch of the Santa Cruz River. And rather than just making the repairs that need to happen to check the box, what Pima County is also doing is saying, hey, residents, hey, businesses, hey, other people, tell us what you want to stuff in here while we've got the seams all busted open. So they came up with 16 structural projects. Some of them are things like levee repairs, you know, very, very as they had to do. But some other ones are making a wildlife bridge across the highway so that wildlife aren't um, being impacted by heavy traffic, creating wetlands, creating trash collection devices, doing a vegetation management plan, all of these extra things that they are opting to do because they know how important the Santa Cruz River is. So Sonoran Institute was involved in an advisory capacity in this project that went on from 2019 to 2021, where we sought input from the community about whether they think that these projects are important. And looking at them here, some total on the left, 1,400 of those projects, or those 20 projects were reviewed 1,400 times. And to the question, this is a, an important project that should be prioritized, we have over 80% of people agreeing in some form. And the, it's a rarity when people disagreed. And when they did, they had really good reasons for disagreeing on it which is very useful to provide to Pima County. So this is another example of community engagement that Sonoran Institute's doing and that we're proud that our partners are doing as well. Next up. And as Claire mentioned, we just recently had Santa Cruz River Research Days. This is our 12th Santa Cruz River Research Days. This year, each year it's a different theme. This year was based on the culture and archeology span of the Santa Cruz River. There's plenty of presentations on fish and dragonflies and water chemistry and all of that, but we, we used the current interest around the Santa Cruz River and around its culture and archeology span to make a specific theme uh, custom to that. And we, this is a two day event and we had artists and scientists and engineers and policymakers all presenting uh, and we did so with real-time English Spanish translation. So we have about 20, 23% of the population here in Tucson and Pima County speak Spanish. And prior to a couple of years ago, we were unable to engage with them. Now, because of Zoom and partly because of the pandemic, you know, we're able to have a much more streamlined engagement where we're able to, where folks want to listen or speak in Spanish and still communicate with their peers around river issues, we can do that now. And it's great. And we do something, next slide, very similar to that with our Living River Reports. I linked these in the, um, in the chat a little while ago, but we have started producing these, again, both in Spanish and in English, because it's so deeply important that every member of our community is aware of just what a really special and beautiful amenity the Santa Cruz River is, and that people are doing a lot of work around it. You know, this is a, this is a product that Sonoran Institute puts out with our partners in Pima County and our partners at Tucson Water. Those two entities spend a lot of taxpayer money in making the Santa Cruz River what it is. And it's really important that we have them as partners because we get to tell the community, hey, look what your taxpayer money is going to, look what your elected officials are doing and supporting. Um, and that's proven year after year to make this a very important um, asset for education, general interest and policy. And all of this comes together, next thought, Claire, to fall within the mission of the Sonoran Institute. So we were founded in 1990, we're over 30 years old. And th since our founding, we have endeavored to connect people in communities with the natural resources that nourish and sustain them. And what that looks like is conservation at the tune of half a million acres an investment for the, for the environment at a third of a billion dollars uh, in our 30 years. Um, we, we are great at 
working with partners and making sure that the vision that they have when it matches the vision that Sonor Institute has, that it happens. And that it happens in a big way uh, with big projects. We're neutral, we're conservation minded, we're apolitical, um, but we are able to get a lot done and we're not afraid of big projects. Um, and to that, we work throughout the American West. Um, here we have 40 million people in our, in our watershed, 5.5 million acres of farmland, there are U.S., Mexico, tribal nations throughout this, uh, throughout this basin, tons of high biodiversity areas, and a huge economy, and a huge and growing economy. So what we do in this, uh, in, our, in our work shed, in our watershed, is, you know, we have, we have a vision where rivers are flowing, landscapes are healthy, and all communities thrive. We have three projects, uh, three programs, the Colorado River Delta, we have a huge team that is working to restore the very, very, very end of the Colorado River, where it enters into the Gulf of California. So this is helping them, helping our team and helping the US and Mexican authorities restore through dredging, through tree planting, through education programs, um, and how to help them use the water that they're all allocated from the Colorado River to occasionally reconnect the Colorado River to the sea. We managed to do that in 2021. And again, in 2022, Mexico is gonna request a release of water to connect the river to the sea once again. Then we have the Santa Cruz River Program, um, which you all know about at this point. So I will move on to the third program, which is called Growing Water Smart. Growing Water Smart is a bit of a, oops, there's something, a bar just came up in the middle of the screen there, Claire. You see that? <laughs> um, this is a project program where we work with interested municipalities who want to use their water more wisely, use their water smart. Uh, at this point, we have worked with municipalities that represent over half of the population of Colorado. And we've now had for Arizona workshops where we've had representation from the Valley, from uh, Cochise County, from tribal nations, Tucson, Pima County, all Flagstaff, Avondale, all over the place have come in with the charge from their residents of, hey, we gotta do something about water. We have a lot of development and water use is going up. We understand the development's gonna happen but we need to be more smart about how we use the water, how to decouple water from development. So we work with these interested municipalities to help them do that. And while this is our reach so far, we have a new program that we're about to kick off in California, and we're looking to bring this project to the border communities, Ambos Nogales, um, El Paso and Juarez, uh, San Diego and Tijuana. They're all on a shared each of them individually are on a shared aquifer and use a lot of the same infrastructure, but are really not communicating. And oftentimes they're not using that especially wisely. So we're researching how we can expand this program really throughout the entirety of the West. And I believe with that, yes, um, please, I invite you all to check out Sonoran Institute. We have a really great social media presence. Our website is lovely and if, what Claire and I have talked about today moves you and you have the ability to, um, please do consider donating to us. We are a very small operation that does a lot with a little and your support really would go a long way. With that, thank you all for this opportunity. Uh, and I, if we have time for questions, um, we would love to talk more about this clearly. <laughs> Great. All right, thank you so much. That was wonderful information. You guys and your institute are doing phenomenal. Phenomenal work on that river. <coughs> um, excuse me. Um, Trisha, do you have a few questions? I saw some in the in the chat. Yeah, there were a few. Let's see. We found out why the trees died. So we got that answer. And we've got answer on cumulative total. <clears throat> but Gordon uh, Schreier wants to know how you get from a fishless stream 
to one with new species? How did they get there? Yeah, that is a great question. So we don't know for certain. Um, these non-native species may have been introduced um, or got washed into the system during you know, big storm events. Um, I know last year in particular with our very wet monsoon, you know, local lakes and things that are stocked might have had some spillage into, you know, washes and things and that made their way down to the Santa Cruz. And unfortunately people do put fish and pets and other things that aren't supposed to be in the bullfrogs. river that get put there. Um, and yeah, bullfrogs um, can make their way <laughs> from one water body to another. In terms of the native fish, um, aside from the two introductions that I mentioned in the presentation, we don't know of any like official introductions. And so for the Nogales area, the dace were definitely present um, upstream and the top minnow were definitely were in Mexico and, and some tributaries. So they might've just made their way down during some flooding events. And then because the water quality was better, they were able to establish and thrive. And in Tucson, we assume a similar situation, but it, it didn't seem like the top minnow in any case weren't coming from the Nogales area because some genetics work demonstrated that they were more similar to top minnow in the Cienega Creek and the closest population um, is Sabino Canyon. So it might be that they came down um, in some flows from Sabino Canyon, but we just won't ever know for sure. <laughs> but nobody is stocking the non-native fish um, in the river. So those are somehow getting placed there yeah. or getting washed in. Interesting. And just one more thing on that. It seems like um, the non-natives are not as good at dealing with our, our flashy flooding systems. And so um, we actually saw fewer non-native species last year compared to previous years. And our native species were also a little bit down in number, but um, they were seeing that at other places in the state as well. And they presumably will come back just fine. Um, um, Trisha, you had a question? Yeah, just uh, one other question for me about the secured water concept. Um, and in terms of the San Pedro, there's been talk about it, it gets absorbed into a drier soil and so even the areas that have had effluent contributions on the San Pedro are reduced in flow. Yeah. So if your water dried out in this secured water area, um, who, who supplies the water? Where does it come from? Yeah, I mean, this, it's, this is an important question. Um, and Claire touched on it a little bit. I mean, this, this is all water that comes down, the, that goes down the drain. It's storm water, which is great when that happens, um, but it's what we flush it, what, it's what goes down the drain. So that does provide some real resilience to climate change, assuming that the population of people here isn't gonna totally empty out anytime soon. There's gonna be a steady amount of effluent that if cleaned well, as it is here in Tucson and Pima County and down in Nogales, um, will result in continued uh, flows of the river. And they are just part of the effluent water portfolio. We take, we collectively um, take uh, some of this or a good chunk of this reclaimed water and it gets recharged in various recharge facilities, you know, out in the desert or wherever convenient to try to help bring up the groundwater table. Um, and th those, I'm curious about the evapotranspiration at those big open pools where the water is entered compared to shady riparian corridors where sure the trees are gonna take up some of that water. Um, and that would result in a loss, I guess, but it's a loss at the, to the benefit of there being trees and wildlife and cooler temperatures around there. Um, so I, I think that it's, 
something that's particularly important with the type of reporting that Sonoran Institute does and that other entities do is to show all of the benefits that come from putting water in a river. And it goes beyond just recharge, but just recharge is a big deal. So making the point that that brings all of those associated environmental values and benefits with real, in, uh, with real economic ties is hopefully a persuasive argument to our elected and appointed officials. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> well, that was um, great information, great slides and pictures and congratulations on all the good things that are happening down there. <coughs> and I thank you for sharing them with us um, tonight. So and really thank you to all who, um, who watch this and who more who will watch the recordings later. But thank you again, everybody. Yeah. Yep. Thank Thanks. you so much for having us. Good night. Good night. Thank Good you. Night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good job, Claire.